I always feel bad when I come to talk to professionals like yourself about national security strategy development. Um, all of you know far more about national security in Africa than I ever will. Many, if not most of you, know a lot more about national security strategy development than I do. Uh, so I always feel kind of kind of nervous, sort of being asked to uh, to talk to the Pope about theology. Uh, but in any case, hopefully I'll, I'll say some things that uh, uh, that you might find useful in your in your discussions uh, later on today. Um, I want to make a couple of points right off the bat, and, and the first thing I want to do is mention the remarkable events uh, in the Gambia of, of the previous uh, several weeks. Remarkable in that the triumph for democracy in the Gambia, something that I, I can assure you, my daughter just spent two years there in the Peace Corps. I don't think anybody ever expected that there was going to be an election in the Gambia where, in fact, the people got to express their genuine will, and that will was, in fact, observed. And the second thing that was remarkable was the rapid and forceful action of ECOWAS and the ECOWAS member states to ensure that that democratic process was honored and to ensure a peaceful transition. That relates back to national security strategy and national security strategy among the individual member states. And if you want to talk about that and ask me why I think that is, we, we can maybe do that in the discussion period. Uh, the second thing I want to, I want to, uh, emphasize, and I should mention, I'm just speaking for myself, okay? I don't speak for the U.S. government or anybody else or the Africa Center. Some of the things I'm going to say are a little outrageous. Uh, they're my opinion. Take them, take them or leave them. National security strategy, how you define it, what you call it, what it looks like, is unique to each individual country. There is no one-size-fits-all. There is no approved model. And your national security strategy is going to be driven by the guidance you receive from your political leadership, by your security situation, and by the priorities that you, your presidents, your legislatures, and your people set. And they're not going to be the same as America's priorities. And your, your documents probably aren't going to look anything like an American national security strategy. My point is that it's your strategy, and you collectively are responsible within each of your member states for figuring out what, it's, what it needs to look like. Having said that, it has been my observation that there are some interesting commonalities that I have seen in national security strategies across Africa. Uh, and they are distinguished from the way it's done in America or Canada or Germany. Uh, and the things that strike me completely uh, most, uh, most uh, importantly are they tend to be consultative they tend to be participative, and they tend to include a legislative role. Consultative in that African national security strategies and processes tend to reach out to a lot of different collaborators and bring them together, especially outside the defense and military complex. Something doesn't happen in Europe or North America very much. Uh, they tend to be participative in that they frequently involve dialogue with the public about what the strategy should look like, how it should be crafted. In some cases, Malawi is a great case in point, the strategy is actually disseminated, the draft. And public, uh, public meetings are held. So people have an opportunity to comment on it. And finally, one of the striking things is that legislatures tend to play active roles as partners in the national security process in Africa. So I, I offer that for what it's worth. Um, I'd have to say that, to be honest up front, I frankly think the African approach to national security strategy that I have described is the wave of the future. I think the continent is ahead of most of the rest of the world in this regard. The United States certainly doesn't do it that way. Uh, I think that Africa is really on the cutting edge of national security strategy, largely because you're confronting in, a, in the most immediate way all of the myriad of non-traditional challenges that we're all that we're all facing across the world globally. Okay, um, some points I want to make here. Let me see. Ah, there we go. Okay, and I'm just going to talk this very very quickly. Um, it's an interesting question, and and my impression is most African states, 
from talking to professionals like you from across the continent, have some kind of national security process. Many of those states have something that looks like a national security strategy, a document, whatever they choose to call it. Um, and I would, I would say the vast majority of African countries, if they don't have one, they're in the process of developing one. Now, 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. If you would have asked me about national security strategy in Africa 15 or 20 years ago, I mean, my answer would have been, look, I care, but I don't care, okay? They, 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 they just don't use that. Uh, they, you do now, from what I can see. That's what makes this particularly important because you have your hands on some of the most important processes in the world. Developing national security institutions, structures, processes, and strategies to deal with some of the most difficult problem sets that I think we have ever encountered. Um, okay, let me see. I'll just put this up. I, I know you've talked about this, but it's worth talking about it again. It's not just a glossy document. It's the process by which that document is developed, and you can't separate that because the process is going to tell you what ends up in the document, and it's whether, in fact, the document is implemented. The best national security strategy in the world, tossed in a bottom drawer and never looked at again, I mean, blinding flash of the obvious, it isn't going to be much help to anyone. Okay. Um, why are we doing this? This is actually a, a conversation, especially outside defense and military circles. This is a conversation you need, to ha you, you need to have. Why do we need a national security strategy? And my suggestion is national security strategies supported by that decision-making process and by those national security stru structures can do four things. One, it can help your political leadership make tough decisions quickly in times of crisis. Number two, it can help all the different players inside your governments, the donors, other states, sub-regional organizations, the African Union, it can help that collection of actors implement that strategy more effectively, act more effectively. Once the presidents, the heads of state have taken a decision, we're gonna, we're gonna intervene in the Gambia if they don't sort that out. National security strategies and processes can help that implementation process, if it includes implementation. Uh, national security strategies can underpin the planning process. Now, this is, this is going to get a little esoteric. How many of you are either military or have a military background? Raise your hands. Everybody who, who is military or who has a military background, please. Come on, this is not rhetorical. Come on, let me see who the guys, if you were in the military, raise your hand. Thank you. Okay. Militaries have a planning culture. Okay? We plan. It's what we do. We're good at it. Your civilian counterparts do not have a planning culture. The police do not have a planning culture. The Ministry of Justice does not have a planning culture. The Ministry of the Interior, the Border Forces do not have planning cultures. Even your civilian defense officials, in a lot of cases, if they have a planning culture, it's a weak one. So why do I mention planning? National security strategy can underpin planning exercises that help communicate that planning culture to your colleagues outside the military. And that's going to be critically important when it's time to actually do something. I wouldn't underestimate it. Planning exercises are always valuable, and they're most valuable when you bring in the non-military partners and incorporate them in those planning exercises. OK. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've already talked about it. The point I'm going to make about this slide is that national security is whatever your political leadership says it is. OK? And that definition is going to differ from state to state. It may differ in the same state from administration to administration. 
It may even differ within the same administration. Over time, it may change. Well, last month, we defined it as this month. This, the next month, we're going to define it as something else. And the point I'm making here is how what you incorporate in national security is going to be driven by your particular needs, by your policy leadership, by your political decision making. And it's not going to look like the country next door. Now, what is important, regardless of how you define it, within that strategy document, you need to prioritize. One of the challenges to this new human security stuff says, oh, it's, it includes everything from everybody has a job, to public health, to the police. If national security is everything, then national security is nothing. That, that's the challenge. If you define it too broadly, so what do you have to do in a national security strategy document? You have to get beyond all these little categories that define it, and you've got to say, what are the priorities? What is most important? Where are we going to put our resources? What is the focus of our strategy going to be? Is it going to be the military and defense hard security aspect? Is it going to be policing and law enforcement? Is it going to be drugs? Uh, is it going to be economic development? Is it going to be poverty alleviation? Whatever it is, your strategy needs to articulate how you're going to approach that. What is more important and what is less important? Okay, now we get to the two most important slides of this presentation. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'm getting short. Okay, and they're on the big questions about crafting the strategy and the big questions about implementing the strategy. When you look at these questions, the questions, the answers are not important because the answers are going to be different for each one of your countries. What is important is to ask the question and to ask it at the front of the process, not at the back of the process. If you spend your time developing this, glassy, this nice glossy document before you've figured out who it's intended for, don't be surprised if the document you end up with at, 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 the, at the end isn't really what you were looking for. So what are these critical questions? One, obviously, who's gonna, who, who are the stakeholders? Okay, And you spent this morning, I think, talking about that. But in practical terms for you guys, because you're going to be in the drafting process, it's not just who the stakeholders are. It's who's in charge. Okay, Specifically, not just, oh, the office of the president. Who specifically is going to oversee that drafting process? Is it going to be the chief commander in chief of the defense forces? Is it going to be the chief of staff in the president's office? Is it going to be the minister? Whoever. Somebody needs to, to be in charge of that process, and they need to lay out what that process looks like. What is the role of the legislature? Again, you've got to think about this in advance. And what is the level of public consultation? Is the process going to be secret? There might be some very good reasons for why you want to keep some elements of your national security strategy secret. And we can talk about those if you want to. Who are the intended audiences? Is this document intended for the public? Is it intended to communicate the president's vision? Is it intended for you guys? For the national police? For the military? For the Ministry of the Interior? For the Border Forces Commander? Is it intended to help you all collaborate together to do your jobs? Is it intended for external partners, like the country next door? Is it intended to talk about mineral rights in that lake that separates the two of you and communicate your position on mineral rights to your neighboring country? Is, intended, is it intended for the donors? Is, in, is it intended for the African Union or the sub-regionals? Are those your intended audiences? Are your potential adversaries intended audiences? And the reason you need to answer that question is because that's going to dictate not only what the strategy looks like, it's going to dictate how it's released and who gets to see it, and it's going to dictate how you're going to disseminate it. If it's for your public, if, if one of your intended audiences is a broad population because you want them to support the president, and it's not made available to the press, and it's put in a secret vault, obviously it's going to be a little difficult to convince the public that they ought to support that strategy. What is the drafting process? Now we're getting into real nuts and bolts, but these are going to be important for you at your level.
Who's actually going to put pen to paper? Who's going to write it? And then who is the draft going to be distributed to? How are they going to comment? Are those comments going to be incorporated into the final version? And how is that going to happen? These are rather mundane aspects that need to be addressed if you want the national security strategy drafting process to go smoothly, if you want the, the stakeholders to have a real input to it, and if you want to end up with a strategy at the end of it that accomplishes the objectives that have been laid out for you by your political leadership. And finally, who funds it? This is a real problem, and why is it a problem? It's a problem because funding and, implement and, and drafting are typically disconnected. At least they have been in the West. They have been in the developed world. And that's because the office of the president, the executive branch, drafts it. But the legislature funds it. So if you don't involve the legislature in the process, you can't really have a resource piece. And one of the features of national security strategies in the developed world, to include the US national security strategies, they don't discuss resourcing. Not my job. If you don't discuss resourcing, you're going to have a really hard time implementing the strategy. The best way to do that that I've seen has been to incorporate robust consultation with legislative peace and security committees, national security committees throughout the drafting process. And several countries in Africa have done that very, very well. OK, big questions on implementing the strategy. One of the other problems with national security strategy sort of on the, the European and American side, it's long on strategy, short on implementation. In other words, it's broad conceptual doc, documents that say, oh, this is a good idea. We need, to, we need to make everybody happy. We need to secure our borders with very, very little detail on how those objectives are actually going to be implemented, how that, that crafting of ends, ways, and means is going to get you to more security borders in the, in the end. So my suggestion is, on implementation, you need to ask these questions. To the extent you can include the answers to these questions, whatever they are, in the strategy itself, you're much more likely to have a strategy that will have an impact. Who leads implementation? And I give you a, a, a hint. It's probably not going to be the same office that led the drafting of the strategy. Who is going to lead implementation when you need to put together for example, a major anti-rustling anti uh, task force that's going to go up to the tri-border area and do something about all the cattle rustling up there. Or when you're going to send substantial military forces in harm's way in Somalia as part of Amazon. Who's going to lead that implementation? How are critical decisions taken and implemented? How are your especially non-military, non-defense partners going to be incorporated in strategy implementation? How are you going to get the police out to the copper belt where the police don't have vehicles, they don't have transfer, transportation, they don't have uh, support bases out in the copper belt? So you're the Zambian uh, the National Security Advisor. You're going to send a couple of infantry battalions out there. You want the police to go with them. Well, how the hell are the police going to get out there? These are the kinds of implementation issues that need to be addressed. Oversight, accountability, and adjustment. Who's going to be responsible for monitoring that strategy? For measuring whether you're accomplishing what you're intended to accomplish? To the extent that you can include that in the strategy itself, you're well ahead of the game. And if you take nothing else back from this presentation, I take those two slides, that one and the one before. Okay. Where are we here? Oh, yes. National security. People always ask me, well, what are some examples? What are some good examples for national security strategies from Africa? Well, the first one I point to is the Defense White Paper in South Africa published in 1996. This was a defense white paper that was designed to support an extraordinarily challenging transition to black majority rule. And it had a lot of features that in 1996 were really new. Features like... Um, it, was, it was, uh, had a huge human security component. Uh, it touched on a lot of fields that were not traditionally associated with the military and defense. Uh, it was intended to focus on accountability, on uh, public safety, 
The whole point of the white paper was to try and move away from a, a complex and a strategy designed to support the white regime and support apartheid and move it towards a strategy that is designed to support the people more broadly, that is designed to serve the interests of the public. And in that respect, the South African defense white paper in 96 is worth reading. The second example I wanted to talk about was Liberia. Um, remember I said that the strategies are going to look different from country to country, and they're going to look different over time in the same country. In Liberia in 2006, when Johnson Sirleaf, President Johnson Sirleaf came to power, the first thing that she produced was the 150-day action plan. Okay? Now, this was, in part, a national security strategy. It was short. It was simple. All it did was identify specific objectives. It missed a whole bunch of the stuff that for the last three days you've been told have to be in a national security strategy. But I will tell you, because I was there, that every major official in that new government that had, that, that had nothing on the ground, it was overseeing a completely failed state. Every major official had that up on the wall in his office. And he looked at it every day. Because he understood that President Johnson Sirleaf had overseen its development personally, that it reflected her priorities, and that was their guidance for how they should focus their efforts. Now you go forward a year later, and you see a poverty reduction strategy that is produced by the Johnson Sirleaf administration. That includes a significant national security component. And once again, this tells you a little bit about the Johnson Sirleaf priorities, about what's important what we care about. How do we define national security? We define it in human security terms. And a year after that, in 2008, the defense community and the security community within Liberia produces the national security strategy, which is more narrowly focused on security, but well beyond defense and military. So those are all, by the way, available. Uh, they're on the net. And if, you're if you want to look at a couple of strategies that are worth looking at from Africa, I'd look at all three of those. And then the final example is the, is the example of Malawi. Malawi began producing a national security strategy two administrations ago. Uh, the process actually began before the transition to President Banda. It continued after the transition from President Banda to President Mutarika. And it had some striking features that I think are uh, going to become typical of national security processes in Africa. One, it had a robust public consultation uh, element. That strategy was taken to each of the four major regions of Malawi after the draft had been developed. It was presented in large public meetings with stakeholders from local government, uh, from uh, non-state actors, from civil society. And the intent was to show them, here's a strategy we're, we're working on. We want to know what you think of it. Then it was taken back. It was also produced in collaboration for the first time, I might add, with the Malawian National Legislature. The Security Committee actually participated in that process. Uh, I attended one of the first meetings, and one of the comments that was made by several of the parliamentarians to me was this is the first time the government has ever sat down and talked about this kind of stuff with us. So that, by the way, that strategy ended up not being published in part because of the challenges of moving from administration to administration. It had not been released. When, Vice, when President Banda lost her bid for re-election, and President Mutarika has yet to decide to release the strategy uh, into the public sector. So on that note, hopefully I've generated some good questions for you. And uh, I will turn the table over to my colleague, Asif. <laughs>